Mike, corral them. Corral them. Oh, well, you can do that, that too. With, you can probably do that too. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. They all go running out the door, and he's like, hey, hey. <laughs> oh, goodness. 2 Samuel chapter 17 in your Bibles. Beginning with verse 15 through the remainder of the chapter tonight, this is, as we noted earlier, this is setting the stage. Next week in chapter 18 will begin the battle of David against his son, which I'm sure David did not appreciate, did not enjoy at all, knowing that uh, he was fighting his own son. And David had to know because... God had already told David, we'd talked about this before, God had already told David that Solomon was going to reign. Solomon was going to be king. So somewhere in David's mind, he must have known that this effort, this coup attempt by Absalom is not going to go well for him. He's probably going to get killed through this. And it's a sad situation for David to be in. He is God's anointed. Absalom is not acting wisely as as he should have he has not embraced Yahweh the God of Israel as his own God he's usurping his own agenda he's forwarding his own goals and his own desires in spite of God's anointed nothing good is going to come out of this just like when you see your children or you see somebody going down a certain path in life you know It's nothing's good is going to happen here. It's going to be by God's grace that they that they get through this and safely without any damage, because, you know, the path they're going down is 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 no good. God is not going to bless these efforts. You can see that and it's painful and yet you can't change the heart of a person. You pray for them intently, pray that God protects them, pray that God changes their heart and brings them back around to the truth. Perhaps David prayed all of those things for Absalom. But we know from Scripture that Absalom did not listen. Now, as we approach verse 15, we must remember that we know more than the characters know that we're reading about here. The writer has opened the door, so to speak, to the control room, and God is seated at the controls. And how we know that is from the latter part of verse 14. For the Lord had ordained to thwart the good counsel of Ahithophel, so that the Lord might bring calamity on Absalom. You see, Hushai doesn't know this. Ahithophel doesn't know this. But the writer does, and now he's alerted us to this. So you and I understand more than the characters do that we're reading about. The writer has opened the door. We know that God is seated at the control center here. And we are confident now that David will succeed because we know that David is God's man for the hour. However, even with this assurance, the details that are offered here in this next section force us to the edge of our seat Because this is the stuff that makes narrative so thrilling and it brings us back time and time again to divine adventures like we're going to read tonight. Verses 15 through 22 record the progression adopted by the secret friends of David after that Absalom had heard the counsel of Ahithophel and Hushai. It is a little episode of God's providence Though sovereignty is hidden here in here, providence brings it to the surface. Providence brings it to the surface. And then a little bit later in verses 24 through 29, that's going to more so set the stage for the civil war that will result in the death of Absalom, unfortunately. But there's a lot between... There's a lot in verses 15 through 22 before we get to verses 24 and following. So let's read verses 15 through 22, and then we'll come back and make some comments. Then Hushai said to Zadok and to Abiathar, the priest, This is what Ahithophel counseled Absalom and the elders of Israel, and this is what I have counseled. 
Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend the night at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means cross over, or else the king and all the people who are with him will be destroyed. Now Jonathan and uh, 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 excuse me, Ahimaaz were staying at En Rogel, and a maidservant would go and tell them. And they would go and tell King David, for they could not be seen entering, entering the city. But a lad did see them and told Absalom. So the two of them departed quickly and came to the house of a man in Bahurim who had a well in his courtyard. And they went down into it, into this well. And the woman took a covering and spread it over the well's mouth and scattered some grain on it so that nothing was known. Then Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house and said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said to them, They have crossed the brook of water. And when they searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. It came about after they had departed that they came out up out of the well and went and told David, King David. And they said to David, Arise and cross over the water quickly, for thus... Ahithophel has counseled against you. Then David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed the Jordan. And by dawn, not even one remained who had not crossed the Jordan. So I think we'll stop right there at verse. uh, Well, let's read one more verse. Verse 23. Now, when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and rose and went to his home, to his city, and set his house in order and strangled himself. Thus he died and was buried in the cave of his father. Strangled himself means he hung himself. So that's the section. Now, this is what you see what I mean by this is the stuff that makes narrative thrilling and it brings us back time and time again to this divine adventure. Here is the, the underground. And you know what I mean by underground. This is, this is the underground. This is nobody, under, nobody uh, in, in the current government knows what's going on here. But there are two people informing other people who are going outside the gate to inform other people and hiding him. And nobody knows about this, but somebody saw him and now they're hiding in a well and everything and just... This is, this is thrilling. This is exciting stuff. So what verses 15 and 16, what do they say? Well, they tell us that Hushai's counsel, Absalom declared, was better than Ahithophel's counsel. We know that, right? Uh, he said that in verse 14. He's told us that. But Hushai evidently had been dismissed sometime between verses 13 and 14. So sometime between verses 13 and 14, Hushai was dismissed and he didn't hear what Absalom said. The counsel of Hushai, the archite, is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. Evidently, Hushai didn't know that. He was dismissed. He didn't hear them say that. He did not hear the writer say what verse 14 and verse, the latter part of verse 14. He didn't hear that. Hushai had accomplished the first mandate that Israel's king in exile had given him. That is to turn or counsel against the counsel of Ahithophel. Back in chapter 15 and verse 34. This is what David desired of him. He said, if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so I will now be your servant. Then you can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel for me. So Hushai has done, has accomplished this mandate of, of uh, thwarting the counsel of Ahithophel. But Hushai doesn't know it. So you see in verse 15 and 16, he goes to David or he goes to um, Zadok and Abiathar and he says, this is what I counseled. This is what is what Ahithophel counseled. He doesn't know which one. He doesn't know that Absalom is favoring his and not Ahithophel's. So he gives them both. He gives them both stories, both what he said and the other man said. 
So without hesitation, as we noted, verse 15, he sought these guys out. These guys, Zadok and Abiathar, are David's Aaronic uh, priest. And he told them what he said and what the other guy said. And uh, Hushai's strategy, then he says, he gives them Hushai, he gives them a strategy. He says that uh, what he told them was based on the assumption that Absalom might be persuaded to follow Ahithophel's plan. You see, that's why he tells them, you can't spend the night. Because Ahithophel's plan, ready, remember this, is to gather 12,000 men and go after him now. And catch David while he's tired and he's, he doesn't have good food supply. He hasn't found a place to hide yet. Just dog his trail and find him while he's tired and weak and scattered and get after him. That was his counsel and it would have worked. But verse 14, the Lord had ordained to thwart the good counsel of Ahithophel. But Hushai didn't hear this and he didn't, certainly didn't know this. So he is giving his counsel to Zadok and Abiathar based on his thought that Absalom is going to follow Ahithophel's counsel. You cannot spend the night. You have to get out. Remember, Hushai's counsel is blow the horn, get everybody together, and go out in mass and find them, which would have taken them at least a couple of days to amass all those people. So you see, the counsel he's given him is based on his thought that Ahithophel's plan was going, was going to be the one that was enacted. If an attack force was actually sent out against David at sunset, then the king and his followers would have to move from their present location immediately. So, in verses 17 through 20, in order to convey, convey this vital information to David without arousing suspicion... Zadok and Abiathar entrusted the message to a servant girl. There's a new character here, a new scene, character in the scene. They entrust this message to Abiathar. Evidently, going in and out of the city was being watched. You have to go through gates unless you had a secret passage somewhere. So you were being watched. Everybody who came in, everybody who went out was carefully uh, screened, perhaps. So they knew that getting the information to to David was not going to be as easy as walking out the gate and just saying, telling everybody, I'm just going for a walk, no big deal, I'm the good guy, you don't have to worry about me. So they give it to this servant girl, and she was to pass the information outside the city to the priest's sons. So Zadok and Abiathar are inside, Jonadab and Ahamaz, Ahimaz, these Old Testament names kill me, Ahimaz are outside the city. Now, we've got to get information from one group to the other one, but you have to go through the gates, the city gates, to get it there. How are we going to do this? They enlist the servants, the service of a servant girl. It says that Jonathan and Ahimaz were hiding out, hiding out at Enrogel. It's the site of a spring. Uh, sometimes in Scripture it's called the Well of Job. It's at the junction of the two valleys of Kidron and Ben Hinnom, or son of Hinnom, less than a quarter mile south from Jerusalem. So Jonathan and Ahinnom are not very far outside, just a le less than a mile south of Jerusalem. They're out there. Uh, they're hiding out at this place, at this spring or this well there. And apparently the servant girl used the chore of fetching water as a pretext for going to meet the priest's sons there. Seems like a good plan. Unfortunately, a lad, a young man, saw Jonathan in, and Ahimaaz at Enrogel as they were receiving the information from the servant girl. And immediately she returned to Jerusalem and verse 18 says, and told Absalom. Evidently, they found out, Jonathan and Ahimaaz found out somehow that they had been spotted. Maybe they saw the girl or they saw the lad and they saw the lad run back to, to the walls of Jerusalem and they thought, uh-oh, we've been compromised. But jo Jonathan and Ahimaaz did not hang around there. They had to get away. They knew they had to get away. So whatever it was that, that, that triggered them, that, that got their attention, 
they realized they were compromised and they could not stay there. So they had to get out. And so Absalom sends some of his servants out to find them. So uh, Jonathan and, and Ahimaaz realize that both their lives and their missions are, are now threatened. They are compromised. So the two of them departed and went to the house of a man in Bahurim, just over a mile south of Jerusalem. So it's probably half a mile, three quarters of a mile further south is, what, is the direction they went. Not, much too, not too much farther. Now, there's, there's, of course, people living in this town, and this unnamed citizen of Bahurim was a supporter of David's cause. Otherwise, they would have, probably, they would have turned the men in to Absalom. But they were evidently a supporter of David, um, and they must have been at least moderately wealthy. Uh, they had a house with a courtyard and a private well in it, and they, it was a perfect place to hide uh, these boys, they crawled inside the well, and uh, she put a blanket or something over it and spread straw and different things out to make it look like there was nothing unusual here. There's no reason why you would think anything unusual, and she probably walked forward away from that spot to try to meet them at the maybe the gate of the court or something like that to try to, of course, prevent them from coming in and and walking and f actually falling in the well or finding them in the well. So she was smart in that way. So um, in order to conceal the existence of their well, she scatters stuff all over it. She's a smart girl here. Well, later, of course, the two men show up and they question the whereabouts of Ahimaaz and Jonathan and implicitly admitting she had encountered David's allies, she nevertheless indicated that they were not on her ground. They're not here, she says. They're not on the premises. Instead, she says that they crossed over the water. They crossed over the reservoir of the water, suggesting that, men, that the men had gone further south. And there's no mention here of the woman's husband. Probably he uh, stayed away, deliberately stayed away to avoid the appearance of any irregularity of going on at the house. They didn't want to draw attention or cause them to think anything was unusual. So uh, standard operating procedure is at this time of the day, I am out doing here. And so I'm going to go out and do that so they're not drawing attention. Both the man and the woman deliberately misled Absalom's men. Well, that's pretty clear. And yet the writer doesn't fault them for doing this. And because it doesn't fault them for doing this, it doesn't mean that it's implicit approval of the action. That's, that's not what is intended to be conveyed here. Just as there, just because, and it's the same situation when Scripture makes no comment about polygamy, for example. When Scripture makes no comment about polygamy, is not an implicit approval of polygamy. Scripture has already said and implied in other places that polygamy is wrong. God made one man and one woman, and that's to be a marriage, one man and one woman. That's stated from the very start of creation. So the, the lack of a comment here is not saying that it's okay to lie. Deceptions were employed to save innocent human life in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and chapter 20, for example. But to say that the letter of the law or letter of the Torah was not violated is clearly wrong. They lied. They knew something and they purposely misdirected someone uh, to a different direction. The biblical writer implies that when confronted with uh, this kind of ethical dilemma, uh, the couple chose the least undesirable alternative. As a result, David is, and his entire entourage escaped Absalom's forces. 
If you, we cannot become pragmatic and say, it worked, therefore it must be okay. Or God doesn't say, God doesn't chastise or he doesn't criticize or there's no comment about the wrongness of this, therefore it's okay. No, it's not okay. We cannot become pragmatic. It is wrong. They were deceitful, deceitful and, and it was wrong. The, again, the biblical writer implies that when confronted with the, a dilemma like this, this ethical dilemma, the couple chose the least undesirable alternative. Verses 21 and 22. Well, it came about after they departed, they came up out of the well and went and told King David. So Jonathan and Ahimaaz finally arrived at David's camp. Their advice was designed to prepare David and his group for the worst-case scenario. It is possible that Ahithophel will be upon you at dawn, which means we cannot stay here the night, of course, which is exactly what Hushai said. So David and his group had spent the entire day making a headlong 20-mile journey from Jerusalem to the Jordan River. They were exhausted and they would uh, have relished a peaceful night's rest. But on this night, David and his, all his people with him, verse 22, denied themselves sleep in order to attempt a dangerous trek through the rushing waters of the Jordan in almost total darkness. And in spite of all of these inherent dangers, by dawn, by light the next morning, not even one remained who had not crossed the Jordan. The Lord's hand of protection and blessing had once again wrapped itself around David. David responded. He had to respond. So this is how he escapes. Now he's going to, later in verse 24, he's going to tell us that he comes to Mahanaim, and we'll read a little bit about that. But right now, the, the author inserts verse 23 kind of a break in action. David is escaped Absalom's grip here, attempt, and David is, is safe now at Mahanaim, and we'll read about that. But before he begins to uh, talk about that, he inserts verse 23. Here's what happened to Ahithophel. Well, as night fell on Jerusalem and the troops were still with the king in the city, they hadn't left Yet, Ahithophel realized that his military council had been rejected and that Absalom had lost the only good opportunity he would have to eliminate David. Absalom is a smart man and he realizes that since his council has been rejected, he understands that Hushai's council is going to give David an advantage of escaping to a certain distance of rallying his troops and rallying support, you're going to give me a chance to do that. And if you give David a chance to do that, David is going to beat you. Ahithophel's advice would have probably been the end of David. You need to go after him while he's tired, while they're stragglers, while they're not organized. You're going to, we're going to read later that David is going to set captains over tens and fifties and hundreds and thousands. He's not even organized right now. He's just trying to get away. Ahithophel knew that. Hushai countered that through the providence and the sovereignty of God. Along with this, the realizing that the only good opportunity... To eliminate David had passed by the wayside. He realized that his hope of retaining the preeminent position of influence and honor among the counselors in the royal court had also disappeared. He realized he's a has-been. I mean, here's who shy walks in here, throws out his two cents on the table, and everybody thinks it's great. Well, I know when I'm I know when I've been passed over. He realizes this. More than that, Ahithophel knew that when David returned to Jerusalem, and he would surely return, because Ahithophel is, I think, convinced that David, given him two or three days of rest and relaxation and recuperation, he's going to form an army. But Ahithophel knew that when David returned to Jerusalem, he himself would be executed as a traitor. 
Therefore, after careful thought, Israel's wisest man made the decision to end his own life. Ahithophel's decision to control the circumstances of his own death was a calculated one as well. The phrase, set his house in order, probably refers to the solemn act in which a person gives directions about what is to happen to his property and the family members after his death. It's kind of a, kind of a will, sort of a, a will. In 2 Kings chapter 20, there was another man, Hezekiah. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah, the prophet, the, uh, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. So setting his house in order is he's making all the arrangements. He knows he's going to, to kill himself. So after he set his house in order, he hanged himself. Which is, by the way, the only case in the Old Testament of suicide that we read about. He's the, the only one. Apart from the military men who, uh, who they take their lives rather than being killed by the enemy and being made sport of. You remember Saul telling his armor bearer, kill me, otherwise the Philistines will get me and they'll make sport of me. They'll torture me. They'll do all kinds of stuff. So apart from men doing that in battle... This is the only recorded case of suicide in, in, the, in the Old Testament. Of course, who else did it in the New? Judas. And remember what? Ahithophel is the Old Testament version of Judas. He's the guy who had everything. Judas had everything. He walked in the, lived, I mean, he lived with Christ for three years. Ahithophel, the wisest man. People looked on his word as, it was, as if it was a word from God. With King David, Ahithophel betrayed David, gave false counsel. Judas betrayed, gave false counsel. They both hanged themselves. And that's where it ends. Don't take it any further. Don't make stories. Don't make up stuff from this point on. Just, that's just what Scripture says, and that's where it ends. So Ahithophel is not a type of Judas, in other words. Don't go there. <laughs> Well, the writer makes no explicit judgments concerning its moral rightness or wrongness, the fact that he hung himself. But this is not surprising, for the text was not written uh, as a treatise on the ethics of suicide. That's not why the written scripture was written. One older commentator from the late 1800s said this, What a contrast Ahithophel was to David in his power of bearing disgrace. The contrast is in how he's handling a tough time, in other words. David, though with bowed head, bearing up so bravely, and even restraining his followers from chastening some of those who were vehemently affronting him. You remember the man who was throwing rocks and dirt at him and calling him names? And David said, the Lord has called him to do it. If the Lord has called him to do it, then he needs to do it. Let's just leave him alone. Ahithophel, on the other hand, unable to endure life because for once another man's counsel had been preferred to his. So he killed himself. Very different. Very different men. Nevertheless, the detailed description of Ahithophel's death, preceded by the emphasis uh, of his advanced wisdom, does enhance the critique of human wisdom. Earlier, think about this. Earlier, the counsel of the wise man of Shemai, Shemai, you remember back in chapter 13 when um, David's nephew in verse 3, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemai. Shemai was David's brother. So Jonadab was David's nephew. So the counsel of the wise man of Shemai, back in 13 verses 3 through 5, was shown to bring humiliation to the royal family and death to an heir of the king. It brought death to Amnon. Here, an even wiser man's wisdom, that is Ahithophel's, had led to an inglorious and premature death 
And he was, no doubt, he was an asset to the nation, had been in the past. So the contrast between these, the, not the contrast, but the similarity, but even the similarity is somewhat contrast. Here you have a more wise man, and it results, who is, a, who is an asset to the nation, and results in his own death. So without descending... Without descending to the level of, of the explicit here, the writers, in other words, he just doesn't come out and explicitly say, the writer of the text here conveys the truth that human wisdom, void of divine revelation, results, uh, produces results that are neither desirable nor productive. Human wisdom, apart from divine revelation, in other words, it's your own plan. And my own plan was to, here's what you need to do, Amnon. You need to pretend to be sick. And you have your half-sister come into you and have her do this and have her do that. That's, that's his, that's, I mean, that's, that's Shemai's, or Jonadab's wisdom. That's crazy. And the text doesn't explicitly say, but he tells us, we see the example of chapter 13 and we see the example of Ahithophel here. The text doesn't explicitly say, but we can gather that this truth, that human wisdom void of divine revelation re produces results that are not desirable and they're not productive. In fact, they're counter to God. And in both cases will cost these men their lives. It will cost... Amnon, his life, he listened. And it cost Ahithophel his life as well. Verses 24 through 29. Then David came to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan, he and all his men of Israel with him. Absalom set Amasa over the army in place of Joab, now Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Ethra, the Israelite, who went in to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. Now when David had come to Mahanaim, Shobi, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah, the, of the sons of Ammon, Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar and Barzali, say all those words that fast. The Gileadite from Rogalim brought beds, basins, pottery, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, lentils, parched seeds, honey, curds, sheep, and cheese of the herd for David and for the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So you, you see the condition of David where it states the condition they are hungry and weary and thirsty, which is precisely why Ahithophel gave the counsel that he did. If you give David time to rest and regroup, he's going to beat you. And Ahithophel knew that when his counsel was not followed, that David was going to have time to rest and regroup. And he was going to come back to Jerusalem. And he would be done. And so he had the opportunity to set his house in order. And he did. And then he hanged himself. Because of what he had done. He saw a situation. And he saw no way out of it. Well these verses that we just read here. Sets the stage for the civil war. That is about to begin. And it will result in the death of Absalom. The scene here shifts to locations east of the Jordan. As you're looking at Israel, you go east of the Jordan. In other words, you're heading towards the desert area. You're going opposite the Mediterranean Sea. You're heading out towards the desert area. That's called the Transjordan area. In the New Testament, it's called the Transjordan region. David held up at Mahanaim, a city probably a fortified one, and Absalom and all the men of Israel encamped in the land of Gilead. And also is the pleasant news that David still has supporters. 
We read that. There are still people out there that support David, and that's very encouraging. So specifically, verses 24 through 26, now in exile, east of the Jordan, David went to this town, verse 24, Mahanaim. It's a a walled city by the Jabbok River. It was from this place, Mahanaim, that uh, Ishbosheth had previously governed Israel. Way back in chapter 2 and verse 8, one of Saul's sons, Ishbosheth, for a short time, ruled Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, uh, from this location, Mahanaim, right here. Uh, it's in the territory of Gad. This is the same location where Judah, in the 6th century B.C., would be driven into exile eastward from the Promised Land with their Davidic king forced to live in the capital city of an enemy. In other words, this is the same location years later down the road. It's going to be the same location where Israel is going to be driven eastward from the promised land to exile because of their sin. So once Absalom had mustered his massive array of troops, he too crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. And Absalom's forces were under the command of Amasa, it says in verse 25. Amasa is David's nephew and a cousin to David's general, Joab. So it's, it's all in the family here in some way. There are family ties leading back. Amasa is David's nephew and a cousin to Joab. Amasa's father was Ethria. Or if you have the NIV, it's spelled J-E-T-H-E-R, Jether. And he was probably an Ishmaelite. So again, you have the tribe of Ishmael. You have, um, or excuse me, not uh, the tribe, but you have an Ishmaelite is, is one who is from the, um, uh, from the lineage uh, of Ishmael. And so he's... Uh, probably a conquered people, probably a people uh, under living under the rule of David at this point, or he's an Ishmaelite who came uh, as a follower of the God of Israel and came to be a part of a part of Israel. But this uh, this massive force force camped uh, at Mahanaim. Um, in the great in the land of Gilead, north of Mahanaim. So David goes, and he goes out. And he goes, continues to go south, and camps at Mahanaim. And Absalom's forces are north of Mahanaim. And it says that they camp in the land of Gilead in verse twenty-six. And this region included the city of Jabesh Gilead. We've heard of that term before. The city had, uh, it was the city that had expressed such great appreciation for the Saul dynasty earlier. They had, in other words, they had thrown in their cards in support of Saul, not David. Their toleration of the anti-Davidic forces in their region suggests that they also were working for David's defeat. So as David is escaping Jerusalem, it's, there's indication that he knew where he should not go. He knew pockets that were not supportive of his rule. And he knew of people that were supportive of his rule. And when David was exiting Jerusalem, it's quite probable that he, of course, wanted to stay away from these areas. And Jabesh Gilead had a long history of supporting Saul over David. So verses 27 through 29, uh, it says that, Uh, Though many Israelites east of the Jordan supported their revolt against David, the king had his key supporters in the area as well. This is encouraging. We find some three guys here who are supportive of David, and they helped David and his people out. Each of the individuals mentioned here was wealthy and perhaps owned the, uh, preser- owed, excuse me, the preservation of their wealth to David's successful military campaigns in and around the region of Rabbah. You remember Nahash, right? Nahash said, we're going to put out your, I think it was your right eye, 
Well, you can submit to us, but we'll put out your right eye way back in 1 Samuel. Saul heard about it, rallied his forces. You remember Nahash uh, died, the son of Nahash became king, and David sent the men to congratulate this new king. You remember, they cut their, they cut their garments at waist and shaved half their beards, I think it was. You remember that? That's, that's these guys. Evidently, David was aware of some people around this area that were still supportive of him. Um, it says here that Machir may have been appreciative of David's loyal support for Mephibosheth. And uh, Mephibosheth was someone that he himself had previously provided and helped. And those who, those who helped David included this man Shobi. He is a pagan. He is the son of Nahash, as we said before. Remember, who had been the king of Ammon and who was probably the brother of Hunam. Hunam is the present Ammonite king. You remember, Hunam was the one who shaved the beards, who humiliated David's men, shaved the beards and cut their garments off. Can you imagine running back through the desert uh, with half of your backside sticking out? It's, it's humiliating, but that's, that's what they did. It's this, this is the guy. So Amnon, uh, but we've read about David subduing Amnon since then. So Amnon was presently subservient to Israel. And David and Joab had subdued Amnon about 14 years earlier, back in chapter 12 and verse 26 and following. Machir had been the host of Mephibosheth before David assumed his support and moved him to, to Jerusalem. So Machir had been one who helped Mephibosheth. Barzali, Barzili, Barzillai, Barzillai was a wealthy supporter of David from Rogalim, a town further north in Gilead. So these, guys, these three guys provided David's group with a generous supply of food, much needed food. They demonstrate other characteristics of true friends. They, they initiated help for David and supplied him abundantly when his needs, with his needs and his wants. And perhaps this gift of food was the inspiration for David's uh, psalm expression or expression that we read about in the psalm, Psalm 23 and verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Could that be what David was thinking about as he, as when he wrote the